take your Bible this morning, go to the book of Romans chapter number 14. Romans chapter number 14. We will get back to our series on the home next Sunday. Now, if you, ha- if you keep notes in your Bible from messages, you will probably have notes uh, in there from this message. I preached this message here about three years ago. Uh, and then I started it again uh, at some point since then, and I'm going to preach it again. You say, why? We could preach this about every six months, and it probably won't be, wouldn't be enough. And, uh, and so I've been praying about this for a few weeks, and, uh, and, and the Lord uh, has uh, led us to go back here uh, today. Uh, it's a needed message. You say, why is it a needed message? Do you have flesh? It's needed. And we all need it. <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, look at verse number 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So all of you herbal people out there, God said you're weak. I mean, that's what it says right there. Amen. (laughs) Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master? He standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth uh, God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth uh, God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and uh, uh, rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to a fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, and you could throw in there dress or anything else, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For For he that in these things... Serveth Christ is acceptable, is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Father, we need your help as we try to preach the word of God this morning. Thank you for a good week in Houston. And Lord, we can't live on uh, those blessings today. Those were for last week. And Lord, we need your help today. Touch the preacher, Lord, I need your help. And Lord, touch the listener. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Every heathen in the world knows Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1, judge not. Um, you're not supposed to judge me. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says, he that's spiritual judgeth all things. Well, there you go, Brother Craig, there's a contradiction in Scripture. No, you've got to know your Bible. You've got to know context. You've got to know wording. You've got to know who's being addressed, why they're being addressed. <clears throat> but um, for the purpose of this message, we're going off of the launching point of chapter 14, <clears throat> verse number 1, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye but not to doubtful disputations. Do you know that there are things in the Bible that are clear as clear can be? And there are things in the Bible that are not clear. And Paul is talking about, he proceeds down through here, and I'm going to give you several other examples, but he's talking about things that are, that are not set in stone, so to speak, as some people would like to think. You have heard me say a million times that there are things that I used to preach that I do not preach anymore because I can't find the verses anymore. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I, I mean, I, was a, I, I could tell you what you should do, why you should do it, and take every scripture that I could take out of context, context and tell you why you should do it because the Bible says so. But there are some things that are not as black and white as we think they are. And uh, let me say this. As far as judging, where the Bible is clear, we are already been judged by the book. It's not man that ju has judged us. It's God that has judged us. But where the Bible is not clear, you better be careful about going around judging people. Amen. The word judge means to try, to examine, and pass sentence on. I, I have a title. I titled this message when I first preached it, Judge, Jury, and Executioner. Or in other words, your typical fundamental Baptist today. Uh, the word judge means rightly to understand and discern. That's where people don't do. They don't rightly understand, and they got no discernment, which, by the way, is a trait of the Laodicean church age, no spiritual discernment. All, all unbiblical judging has one thing as its foundation, pride. That is the basis for every, every part of judgment that is unbiblical. Listen, um... I wrote this down later in my notes, but I'm going to say it now. As the pastor of this church, there are things that I want in this church. And as a pastor of this church, there are things that I don't want in this church. And it's my job as the pastor to protect this church. It's my job as a pastor of this church. It's like, it's like the oath of the President of the United States against all enemies, foreign and there are times that i got to protect this church from things that are happening on the outside. And then there are things, times in, where i got to protect the people on the, in this church from people in this church. Protection is protection. Doesn't matter what the, what the source of problems is. And I do not want a church. I want a church where the people are just real. What you see is what you get. I do not want a church, I do not want this to be the first church of the Pharisees. The first church of self-righteous people. My, my pastor in New York, he was great at keeping people in check when it comes to that kind of stuff. You'd come to him with a complaint about somebody else, and before he ever dealt with that, he would point out 30 things that you got wrong with you. It will help you. Problem is, most of us don't receive it. Because after all, other... Uh, we're not as big a problem as other people are. Amen. And um,
we could spend, really honestly, a lot of time covering this topic. We could turn this into a multi-week series. But I'm going to concentrate on this idea about passing judgment when the Bible is not clear. Not clear. Look at verse number one. We are to receive those who may not be as far down the road as we might be. But by the way, if you think you're, if you think you're one of the ones that's further on down the road than anybody else, you're not. You're a fool and you deceive yourself. Amen? Well, you know, them people from the other side of the tracks, we're all from the other side of the tracks. Amen? You're a loser. I'm a loser. We're all no good, dirty, rotten, stinking, filthy sinners made of flesh. It amazes me that I have a problem with pride. Why do I have a problem with pride when I'm just a animated dirt ball but we do in other words some that are spiritually less mature but not to doubtful disputations number one if you think you are even one ounce better than anybody else you are proud and self-righteous and what do you by the way what do we use as the criteria for thinking we're better than somebody else outward stuff Stuff we see, stuff we think we see. Uh, we are not to receive the weak for the purpose of judging them, condemning them. We are not to receive the weak of, ha ha, fresh meat, I'm going to set them straight. There, there was, a, there was a, some folks here not long ago. Uh, well, I don't know how long it's been, I, however long ago. They visited a couple of times. And uh, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you want them here, and Lord, if you really, really want them here, I'll help them. But Lord, I don't want them here. They came for one reason. They were going to set people straight. They were going to judge people. And so when I realized that, I, I told them, I said, uh, I said, I have number one job as a pastor, and that's to protect my church. And I said, I will protect the church if it means you going down the road or being asked to go down the road. And... Uh, God took care of that, and they're not here. Um, the word receive means to accept. We are to accept people that are different than us. I know the word diversity is a political term today, but I don't want a church full of robots. I want people that are different. I, I, I mean, you know, it's like all the preachers this week down at Shady Acres. There's all different kinds of preachers down there. There's all different kinds of church folks down there. I mean, they're just all different kinds. We were talking about a preacher. I'm not going to mention his name because of the live stream. Nothing wrong with him. He's a, he's a great guy. I love him, but I just, I just won't mention his name. And this guy pastors a church in South Carolina, and he is the most, you talk about different. He's different. All right? Sister Jean's met him. Uh, I was telling Jeremy and Charity about him. And th this guy is, um, he told the Lord, he said, Lord, I, would you let me pastor the group of people that nobody else wants to pastor? And the Lord has answered his prayers. I've never been to his church, but, I, but I've, I've met a couple of his folks. This is the kind of church he pastors. He had a guy come down to the altar and get saved. He goes from the altar to the preacher, and he said, Preacher, I just got saved. God told me I'm supposed to get a divorce. And the preacher said, No, brother. I mean, you know, I, no. He said, No, God told me I'm supposed to get a divorce. And he says, well, we need to think about this. You know, we, let's get together. We'll talk. He says, no. He says, God told me I'm supposed to go home and divorce my husband. 
He said, yeah, you need to go get a divorce. That's the kind of guy, that's the kind of church this guy pastors. Meth heads and, you know, drunks and dope heads and all that kind of stuff. The kind of people that everybody else looks down on. This, this pastor that I'm talking about, if he's an ounce, he's 400 pounds. He's a big guy. He's the most unorthodox guy you ever see. Any pastor's a, 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 a good church. They got good people. And so uh, we have a mutual friend, and, and uh, he invited this preacher to meet a couple of pastors he was having breakfast with, and they were reverends. He said, I know, he said, I knew they were going to show up to this diner in suits and ties on Monday morning. He said, so I asked him, and he called his name, and he says, let's, and he says, I just, he said, I just wanted to watch the show, get the popcorn out and watch the show. And so he's there, and, and, you know, he's in a, like a dress shirt and a pair of blue jeans and a pair of boots, and, and these two reverends got their, you know, they got their, you know, their uh, reverend outfits on, suit and tie and, you know, crisp and all that. Well, here comes this guy in, in a pair of shorts, a tank top, and a baseball cap. <laughs> you say, Brother Craig, deal with it. Get over yourself. Amen? I'll take those guys any day of the week over the proud, arrogant, self-righteous Pharisee who's got everything just down to a T. I've been out to eat with those guys that have got everything down to a T. And Brother Jeremy, when you get to know them, they ain't got everything down to a T. It's an act. It's a show. It's a facade. They're hiding who they really are. And, um, and so we're supposed to receive into our fellowship. Amen. That means we don't shun them. We don't avoid them. We don't look down on them. And then you go down to verse number two. Paul wastes no time getting down to business here. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth, uh, uh, which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. This is, he's, he's talking here about what, what people eat, what, you know, uh, and uh, what, you know, what different people believe about what they should eat. You, you got this one group, you know, they think you shouldn't eat pork. And I thank God for all those people, because that's more for us. Uh, and then you got this group of people, you, you shouldn't eat fish. And I thank God for those people because I am in agreement with those people. Uh, but, you know, uh, let, you know, one believe it that they can eat, another believe that you can eat. And, uh, uh, and it says, let not him, there's a warning here, let not him despise let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. The word despise means to scorn to disdain, to have a low opinion of, to abhor. Well, you know, you, you can't, we can't fellowship with those people because, I mean, you do know what they believe about, you know, dietary law, which, by the way, was given to the Jews. I'm not a Jew. I am going to eat bacon. I'm going to eat in the gymnasium, gymnasium at Shade Acres Baptist Church on Monday night. I'm having sausage on a stick. Amen. <laughs> and corn dogs. Praise God. But here's the thing. Here's what kills the Pharisees. Look what it says at the end of verse 3. For God hath received him. It kills a Pharisee that God would receive somebody who thinks you could eat pork. It kills a Pharisee to, to think that God would receive somebody who dresses, has different dress standards than they do. Now, now, here's a warning though, here's a warning. The dangerous part about this is on both sides. 
You say, what do you mean? This person here says, you're wicked if you eat pork. Uh, you, if you're a woman and you wear pants, you're wicked. That's wrong. But it's just as wrong to be on this side and say, well, I eat pork and you're wrong. Well, I'm a woman and I wear pants and you're wrong. There's pride on both sides. And guess what? Both are wrong. Amen. Amen. Because guess what? This person who eats the pork and wears pants judges that one, and the one who doesn't is judging the other one. And it just absolutely kills a Pharisee. Here's what I'm saying. They're both Pharisees. They're both Pharisees. And it kills a Pharisee that God would receive them. How could God? Doesn't God know what they do? Do you remember Jesus over in Mark, Mark chapter 5, the madman of Gadara? Do you realize Jesus sat there and witnessed to a guy who was naked? He didn't say, okay, uh, go get some clothes on first and then I'll come back. But I know some Baptists... I, pre I preach for a church. I love them. They're good people. I remember pre they, they had like a Bible club like we had on, used to have on Friday nights. They had, a, they had a, a club like that. And if a girl that they brought in came in with a pair of shorts on, they made her put a skirt on before she could join in the program. It will be a cold day where the booger man lives before I institute any of that garbage. Do I think that they all should dress right? Yes. Am I making that an entrance exam requirement? No. And if you've got a problem with that, you're a Pharisee. And you need to get over your pride and over yourself and get right with God. If Jesus can witness to a man who's naked, amen. Boy, that just hair lips some of you. I, I can see it on your face. I mean, I can see it in your eyes. You think that I'm, you think I'm a liberal compromiser for thinking that way. Well, you're wrong. It's your pride and arrogance and self-righteousness that I hate and God hates. And it's my pride and arrogance and self-righteousness that I hate. Amen? Because I don't want to fall into the trap of being pride for the other reason. But I will guard against that spirit being in our church. And it's wrong. If you do it, I do it. Anybody else does it. Amen. I love how Paul deals with, uh, with this. Here's how he deals with this. Verse 4, who art thou? That's an old English, English way of saying, who you think you are, sucker? That's what he's saying. Who art thou? Who are you? Who do you think you are? What do you think you've got the right to do this for? Is it not what he's saying? Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? That person belongs to somebody else, and it's not you. I had somebody text me over something like this. Well, I'm praying God deals with them. Why do you have that much interest in it? You're coming across as compassionate. When you're not compassionate, you're just self-righteous and full of pride. Look what, why are they doing it? Look verse 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord doth he not regard it. They're both doing it to please the Lord. Well, Brother Craig, how is that possible? Because they're both sinners. What is God dealing here? What is Paul caring about? Their attitude towards God. Not the whatever it is. Verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself. That's a real shock to some people's system. You mean I'm not the standard for everybody else? You mean, you mean God holds people accountable to the Bible and not my thought process? I mean, how could the Lord do that to me? 
Doesn't the Lord know who he has here when he's got me? Oh, he knows. <laughs> he knows exactly what he's got when he looks at us. Amen? And he loves us anyway. We are not the standard. We are not self-sufficient. Know ye not that ye are not your own? You're bought with a price? Well, it's my life. No, it's not. It's God's life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It, it, you go back there to verse 6. They believe that whatever, whether they're regarding the day or not regarding the day, whether they're, whether they're eating pork or not eating pork, whether they're wearing shorts or not wearing shorts, they, they, they're doing it to please the Lord. They're, they're doing it because they're, they're doing their best to, to please God. Do we change? Do we mature? Sure we do. Miss Jean, it goes back to that. Others may, you cannot. If you ain't got that little thing, they're out there in the track rack, do it. There are things I see people doing, and, and God never messes with them. But I know if I did it, God would, he'd be all over me. What's the issue? The heart. So why can that preacher in South Carolina show up in a pair of shorts and a tank top and a baseball cap? He ain't giving one second thought to what he's doing. He's going to meet preachers in fellowship because he got invited. What? If you were to look at him and say, hey, brother, you got, you got a pair of shorts on, he'd say, well, I hope so. <laughs> one of Brother Lutrich's grandchildren was sitting in front of me this week and and uh, he's about oh I don't know how old he is I, I, he's young okay that's all I know he's, young. he's old enough to write and uh, and them are long services and, and, and the kids had these little fake iPads that they would just play on and write on or whatever and, and uh, you could stop right there and judge them well why did they let them do that Oh, you're not, you're not going to have an eight-year-old kid sit through six hours of church a day, okay? And, uh, and he wrote something down on the top of his little fake iPad and showed it to his cousin. I'm telling you, this kid, I don't know how old he is, eight, ten years old, ten, I think he might be around ten not by now. Shoot, I don't know. It said this. He wrote it down and showed it to his cousin and said, I need a girlfriend. And then he looked back and he seen I looked at it and he put it down. I'm dying laughing. I don't know, some preacher up there trying to, you know, pull on the heartstrings and I'm dying laughing. Said, I need a girlfriend. Now, here's a Pharisee. Pharisee. Well, bless God, he shouldn't be thinking about that at that age. I told Gary Jr. My reaction was the same as Gary Jr.'s was. I said, I said, I got to tell you what your, what your kid wrote. I saw what your kid wrote during the church. Here's what Gary read. He said, thank God he said he wanted a girlfriend. <laughs> I said, that was exactly my thought. Amen. <laughs> Somebody got on, on the Evans boys one time. We're going back 10 years ago in a meeting because they was talking to a couple of girls in a meeting. So they go, you know, Mr. Self-Righteous Pharisee uh, goes to Brother Evans and you, they're, talking to, they're talking to girls. He said, thank God. Amen. We ain't got it all figured out as much as we think we got it figured out. I'll use myself as the example for this statement. I may have a standard, but I am not the standard. And we'll get into it a little bit more, but that's all that it is. It's my standard for me. For me. I'm not talking about things where the Bible's clear. I'm talking about things where it's not clear. All right? Um, verse 8. For whether we live, we live under the Lord. Whether we die, we die under the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to God. 
We've got people in this church who think that I don't preach on dress standards enough. All the stuff in that book, you're going to dwell on that? All the stuff in that book about attitude and heart and walking with God, we're going to do on that? If you've got dress standards that you believe that are good for you and your family, have them. I mean, have your girls in dresses to the floor? You don't believe women ought to wear makeup? Don't wear makeup. I like what the old preacher preached years ago. If the barn needs painting, <laughs> paint it. Just thought I, that was free. I just thought I'd throw that out there. I got a good example the Lord gave me the first time I preached this message. It's so good I'm not going to change it when we get to that part. Verse number 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. He died for our souls, not our standards. Listen, when it comes to standards, have all the standards you want, but have God's standards. Have, get your convictions from God. Don't make up your own standards. And if you make up your own standards, make them up. But remember, they're for you. If they're extra biblical, I call them extra biblical standards. If they're extra biblical, then they're just for you. And if you're the man, the husband, the dad, then they're for your family. If you want to uh, uh, institute them in your family, that's between you and God. But you don't judge other people based on your standards. This is the only thing that judges every single one of us. I'm not the judge of anything outside of this book. But here's the problem, and we'll deal with this too. Well, it's in the Bible. It might not be in the Bible like you think it's in the Bible. We are the Lord's. That means we're subject to him. Amen? We belong to God. And let me ask you a question, all you Pharisees. Let me ask you a question, all you Pharisees. Here's a problem with Pharisees. Pharisees are never as hard on themselves as they are on other people. It goes back to the they sin because they're wicked, we sin because we had a bad day. I've never yet met a Pharisee who's just as hard on himself or herself as they are on everybody else. That's just the way Pharisees operate. And uh, <clears throat> we shouldn't be judging other people, but we should absolutely be constantly judging ourselves. Amen. To make sure our heart is right. And again, based on the book. What should we be judging about ourselves? Our attitude? Am I a hypocrite? Am I a Pharisee? Am I full of pride? Is God pleased with my attitude? Is God pleased with my spirit? Do I have a standard that is against Scripture? What do I need to adjust in my life? So answer the question, verse 10. Paul asks another question. He, he says there in verse number 4, Who art thou? Who are you? And then he asks another question in verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? That's not... A rhetorical question. It's a question that demands an answer. Ask yourself, why are you going around judging everybody all the time? Why are you constantly posting on Facebook your standards that you think everybody else should live by? Amen. And I can say that with a clear conscience because I don't see anybody's posts on Facebook. But I have seen them in the past. Why do we judge our brother? <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Why do we judge our brother? You mean they might be saved, even though they don't have the same standard as you? It kills a Pharisee to think that that person could even be saved. 
I don't know, maybe, I hope you're thinking, but I hope you're not quiet because you disagree with me. Because I'm telling you, I know Pharisees that will judge somebody's salvation based on standards. Whether it's dress standards, food standards, TV standards, whatever. That's, I, I mean, I, that's why I like, I, I love Brother Grady. We, I don't think I like him as much now as I did before this week. He threw me under the bus 50 times this week. They got this table set aside for some of the older folks, and and uh, and uh, so we're going to, to lunch there. And and uh, and and one of the young men, Shade Acres, told Brother Grady to go sit down over at the over at the geezer table. And uh, and uh, and he's like, Cobb, come on!" I said, "I said I'm not sitting over there." And uh, and I said, "He didn't ask. He didn't tell me to go sit over there." No, no, you're with me. I said, "I'm not doing it." And so the young man said, you can sit over there, Brother Cobb. I said, I don't want to sit over there. He said, it's okay. Go sit over there. So I went and sat over there. So we're sitting there, and one of the ladies comes up to feed us, and Grady looks at her and says, I don't think he's supposed to be here. <laughs> That's why I don't like him as much as I used to. But I, I love watching Grady talk, because he'll sit there and he'll talk about a movie he watched that I wouldn't watch. But guess what? I'm not Bill Grady's judge. And do I think Bill Grady's any less of a Christian, a preacher, a man of God? No. No. But it kills a Pharisee. How could God use Brother Grady when he's doing that? Or, better yet, they'll go to the other extreme. God ain't using him because he does that. You're a fool if you think that. You're out of your mind. Why do we judge our brother? What, what makes us think it's okay? What, what do we think gives us the right or the authority to do that? Again, we're talking about doubtful disputations. We're talking about only in the matters where the Bible is not super clear. And, and now, if somebody judges you, and I'm not made, and you know, they probably didn't do it in the right spirit. They probably didn't do it the right way. They probably shouldn't even have done it. But if they judge you in a matter where the Bible is clear, chalk it up to they may have not done, needed to do it or shouldn't have done it, and they might have done it wrong. But the bottom line is the Bible already judged you, not them. I'm going to give you an example in just a moment of what I'm talking about. We should not get mad when people judge us based upon the Word of God. Let me put a little parenthesis in here. People will say, well, what if I see somebody going against the Bible? Well, number one, what's your motive for wanting to say something? Is it, is it out of genuine care and concern? Are you going to say something to them because you think that they're hurting themselves or they're hurting their testimony? Uh, then, you know, uh, that's, you know. Or are you saying something just because you're the judge? Because you know. Because God has given you special insight. And so... So that's the first question. The second question is, how serious of a thing is it really? Is it going to matter in the realm of eternity? Is it going to affect that person's judgment seat? Is there consequences, hurt, or harm? And then the third question is, are you able to do it with the right spirit? Romans chapter 15, verse 14 talks about if you're able to admonish. The word admonish means to warn or notify of a fault. It means to reprove with mildness. Mildness. Do you know when you go to somebody and say, brother, with a tear in your eye, brother, sister, can, can I just talk to you about something that I'm concerned about? 
There's a whole, there's a whole different attitude with that than what in the world are you doing that for? Don't you know? If that's your attitude and your approach, then you're not able to admonish. The, and the word admonish means to counsel against wrong practices. Is what they're doing wrong? Is it biblically wrong? Or does it just go against your standard? And here's another question to ask when you're talking about seeing somebody, dealing with somebody like that. Do you have the place in that person's life to do that? Here's what happens. You'll take somebody who never has any interaction with somebody. They never talk to them at church. They never fellowship with the church. They have no relationship outside of the four walls of this building. They don't talk during the week. They don't run into each other. But yet, bless God, they're going to fix them because they see something wrong with them. If you ain't got any fellowship outside of the church with them, do God a favor, that person, and me as a pastor a favor, and shut up. Is it really the kind of relationship you want to have? Oh, well, I only talk to people I rebuke. Well, that's, that's godly. And admonish means to warn or notify of a fault, to reprove with mildness. It doesn't mean to blow them out of the water. Brother Farley preached a great message uh, about what to do when your kids have a target on them, on Samson. And he talked about how when they're four, five, and six years, you, uh, four, five, and six years old, you blow them out of the water for little things. Well, what do you do when they're 15 and do something really bad? And you've already blown your nuclear arsenal when they were young. I am saying this, but I'm going to say it again, and I'll say it some more. The reminder here is when it's not crystal clear. We're not talking about your little pet, little, your pet little extra biblical standard. Doubtful disputations. Now, here's the example I was gonna, I'm going to give you that I mentioned a minute ago. If you see somebody, there is a difference, okay, between somebody who's fornicating and somebody who eats pork, a woman that wears pants. Amen? If there's fornication, that's not fuzzy in the Bible. That is crystal clear. And even though it's crystal clear, you ought to approach him with a broken heart and a tear in your eye and a heart of compassion. So let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, so that's not crystal clear. Okay, so let's take the opposite. You know, I'm going to tweak a, a fundamental Baptist little God here on women's dress. You want, to know why I, you want to know why I like using that as the example? Because I was the card-carrying Pharisee of the women's dress <laughs> preaching club. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. May I give you a not-so-subtle reminder about the situation here at New Life Baptist Church. I'm the pastor. You're not. I don't want anybody helping me, pastor. I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm saying if there's pastoring to do, let me do it. Let me do it. Don't you take it upon yourself to pastor this church. I don't need no deep state I don't need no shadow government shadow pastoral government I don't need Obama pulling the strings okay amen so Deuteron that kind of felt good for me to say that uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man neither shall a man put on a woman's garment they never preach that you never hear about the man putting on the woman's garment. You're thinking, ain't you? It's processing. 
For all that do so are abomination of the Lord. That God. There you go, Brother Craig. Women aren't supposed to wear pants. That's what the verse says. It does? It does? We all know they wore, wore, wore robes back then, right? There must have been a, some kind of difference between a woman's robe and a, a man's robe, right? Okay. Well, there you go, Brother Craig. That's a verse. And after all, bless God, we know Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He doesn't change. So if Deuteronomy 22.5 is good then, it's good now. <sighs> Rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. I love pointing this out to all the Pharisees that use one verse in the Old Testament. Let's, let's read some other parts of the chapter, shall we? Let's go down to, uh, let's go down to verse number 8. When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof. Uh, let's go to your house and check your uh, house out. Uh, anybody got any battlements on their roof? It's only three verses later than your little pet peeve verse. Any turrets out there on anybody's house? <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> yeah, not saying it wouldn't be bad to have. Not saying it wouldn't even be necessary. Okay, no, no battlements? Okay, let's, see, let's look at another verse. Uh, verse 11. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. All right, I need to see everybody's tag. Everybody line up here. Come here, Josiah. Now, he's a guy, so, you know, let's see here. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. What's it say here? Uh, oh, man, no information. <laughs> but... On the jeans or something, it probably says uh, 50% something, 40% something, 10%. Mixed garment, you're going to hell. This is not a 100% wool suit. It's part cotton, probably where I shop, polyester, amen, I don't know. You're going to preach the book, preach the whole book. You're going to preach a chapter? Preach the whole chapter? What's God? You're a woman, you got pants on. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't got a battlement, and I got a cotton wool blend shirt on and, you know, polyester and all that kind of stuff. All right, let's look uh, a little bit further on down in this chapter here. Uh, verse number 24. Uh, verse 23. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out of the gate of that, of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. I don't remember the last time anybody's been stoned for fornicating or, adulter or adultery. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What am I saying? I'm saying you can't pick and choose your little verses. The whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God. There is too much to do in the work of God for us to be judging other people. What the Smiths let little Johnny and little Susie wear and do is none of your business. What your little Johnny and Susie do is your business. But what their Johnny and Susie do is none of yours. So as that little f girl that I known years ago used to say, keep your business in your own nose. <laughs> Let's go on. Let's go back over to Romans chapter 14. Now, don't be a Pharisee on the other side either. Don't 
God's a God of balance. He's not a God of ditches. All right. The Pharisees are on this ditch. The I've got liberty in Christ is on this ditch. And both are wrong. Both are wrong. But why, verse 10, dost thou judge uh, thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I'm going to give an account of Craig Cobb to God. I am not going to give an account to the Joneses, uh, for the Joneses, or the Smiths, or the Washburns, or the Raymonds, or the Bennetts, or the Tetros, or the, do I have to go through everybody? You get the point. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Matthew 12, 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give, excuse me, give account thereof in the day of judgment. I believe... Ain't that even in Scripture? Physician, heal thyself? <coughs> Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. What Paul's saying? Quit your judging. Stop it. Quit it. Oh, but God, I wish so and so was here to hear this message. You just judge somebody for not being here to hear a message about judging people. <laughs> Question. What do you call a person who warns another person about somebody being a gossip? A gossip. Verse 13. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. You know what our judging does to other people? It's a stumbling block to them. Well, you shouldn't wear this. You should wear this. You shouldn't eat this. You should eat this. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't listen. You should. That's a stumbling block. Was Jesus harder on the sinners or the Pharisees? He was harder on the Pharisees. Verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. If I think pork or fish is unclean, then it's unclean only to me. And you know me. I don't think bacon's unclean. And just because it's unclean to me does not make it unclean to anybody else. The standards that you set for yourself and for your family are not to be used to judge others. This is my notes from four years ago. The greatest example I know of this doubtful dispu disputation thing is Sister Alan Jones, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones wore a hat to church. That was her conviction for her. Brother Jones didn't even have that conviction. He said, he, he, he said I've studied it. The, hair co the, the covering in Corinthians is not a hat, it's hair. Okay, so Mrs. Jones had it, but that was her conviction. She would not go into a church service without a hat on. Now, Mrs. Jones is in heaven now, but I've seen her, I've known her for 30 years. You know what Mrs. Jones did not do when she went into a church service? She did not judge one woman who didn't have a hat on. She didn't even, she said no other women has to wear a hat. This is what I do. She didn't judge or condemn ladies who, who didn't have her conviction. She didn't think that she was any more spiritual for having that conviction. 
She didn't go around telling all the other women, you should wear a hat. You need to wear a hat. You should wear a hat. She didn't say a word. She never said a word because it was her. Based on the context of Romans 14, she wore a hat unto the Lord. She did. You know what we need to do? You know what some people in this church need to do? You need to quit going around pushing your convictions on everybody else. They're your convictions. Well, I'm just trying to help. You're not helping. You are hurting. You're being a stumbling block. You're being a stumbling block. Look at verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ had died. You know what we end up doing? Did you see there in verse, in verse number 14, it's just a stumbling block. In verse number uh, 15, we're destroying. You may start out, your helping may start out as a stumbling block, but if you don't stop it, you're going to destroy. You see the progression? Well, bless God, I know what's right for you. You've got to get it in your mind that that's right for you. Where does it stop? For this person, it's a hat. For this person, it's a, I don't know, I can't even think of anything. A burqa. Sister Washburn, if you don't put a burqa on, you're wicked and ungodly. Well, that's what I believe for you. Now, if anybody walks in, if any of you women walk in here with a burqa on, either take it off or just don't come back. I, don't, I mean, I don't, want no, I don't want no burqas around, okay? We're not Muslims, okay? The problem, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, hold your place. For, the, here's the problem, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. If you read the story down here in verse number 8, there were some people that believed you should not eat meat offered to idols. And then there were some people that, we know that an idol is nothing, so why not eat it? You say, well, and then there are people that carry it too far to the other extreme. Well, well, I think eating pork is wrong. And so even though I don't see somebody eat it, I know they are, and they're wrong. No, here's the stumbling block. If I, think, if I know that you think eating pork is wrong, I'm not going to invite you over for pork chops. And I won't eat them in front of you. But I ain't going to not eat them in my house. Amen? Well, I, I would be offended if you ate them in your house. <laughs> Suck it up. You're going to have to deal with it. Amen? God don't even carry it that far. Amen. If that's the case, then we all have to eat the same thing. Where are you going to find that standard? Who's going to set that standard? Amen. You want to know what the pro knowledge puffeth up? That's the problem with extra biblical convictions that are put forced as doctrine on everybody else. And that's what Pharisees did. They taught for doctrine the commandments of men. Have all of the extra biblical convictions. You, and see, a Pharisee doesn't even like me calling them extra biblical because they think they're Bible. I didn't go there, but let's go back to this idea of women's dress. Deuteronomy 22.5, right? The only New, only New Testament verse is dealing with modesty. Do you, know how many, do, you, do you know how many Pharisees? Do you know how many times Pharisees have put people in hell over two verses? Really? Look at all the stuff that's in the Bible that's dozens of verses talk about it. But nobody dwells on those verses. We're going to cherry pick one verse in the Old Testament and cherry pick one verse in the New Testament, and we know what's right for everybody to do.
So if you believe a certain conviction that's doubtful disputation, it's different, it's not clear in the Bible, have all you want. Keep them to yourself. Keep your mouth shut. Don't judge others based on your extra biblical convictions. By the way, and the Pharisees don't like to hear this either, your extra biblical conviction makes you no more spiritual. That does not make you spiritual. You're doing it unto the Lord. Have whatever you want, but have it unto the Lord. Verse 16, back over there in Romans 14. I was in a meeting not long ago. I love using women's dress as this because, like I said, I was a Pharisee in that area, but there, there are so many inconsistencies with that thought process. I was in a meeting uh, uh, years ago, and uh, the teen youth group got up to sing. And there was, I don't know, five or six teen girls in, in, that, or in, in the singing group. But, Jeremy, every single one of them had a dress on. Every single one of them. And there was not a single thing modest about any one of them. They, they, they were revealing. They left very little to the imagination. But they were addressed, so that's okay. Really? I know ladies that wear slacks that are more modest than the dresses. Amen. But because it's a dress and we're Baptists and that's what us Baptists believe, then it's okay. No, I looked over and seen every teen boy on the front row drooling. Just being honest. They've been better off with a pair of loose fitting britches. You're a compromiser, Cobb. No, I'm right. And I'm not being proud and arrogant and self-righteous about that, but I am right. Your standard for you is a great thing. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Have a great standard. But you know what? When you go pushing it and making yourself more spiritual than anybody else, your good will be evil spoken of. Because guess what? You're just enjoying yourself being right, and everybody in the church is going, man, what a lousy attitude they got. Doing a good job, ain't you? Keep up the good work. You may have a noble standard, something that if other people had your standard, it might be a blessing to them. But your standard, wrapped in a proud, judgmental, critical attitude, will not be received well by people who don't share your standard. Listen, I've got respect for people that have different standards than I do. Mrs. Jones, I respect her conviction. But it ain't got nothing to do with her wearing a hat. It has to do with her not telling everybody else that's what they should do because that's the Bible. I got zero respect for people with different standards than me who are self-righteous about it. Verse 17, God gives us a good reminder about the reality of realistic standards. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not about meat and drink and dress and hats and name them, shorts, You say, well, Brother Craig, what's your conviction? What's your standard? I believe men ought to look like men. I believe women ought to look like women. I, be I believe we ought to, when we come to church, look the best that we can. I believe that when we're out in the community, we're representing Christ, and we shouldn't be slobs and look like the world and all that kind of stuff. But there are people who condemn people for what they wear, where they shop, 
where they buy groceries, if somebody's got a TV or doesn't have a TV, where they get their coffee. And contrary to popular belief, where people shop, where people buy groceries, if somebody has a TV or doesn't have a TV, does not determine if that person is saved, lost, spiritual, or unspiritual. So, number one, quit acting like it, like it and number two, quit treating them like it. it. It just always has amazed me since God really set me straight on all this. Why did I care about all that stuff? Like, why did I make it a big deal? What somebody else did. Why does it matter to you if somebody has cable TV or not? Why do you have to have an opinion on if somebody has satellite or cable or whatever? I remember a young man walking up to me. He was trying to prove a point. He was trying to go after one of the other men in the church because they had a TV. And he didn't know about me. He came up to me and he says, uh, Brother Craig, he says, can I ask you a question? He says, do you have a TV? I said, well, I got to be honest with you. I said, uh, I said, I had cable TV for years, and I said, I, I got really convicted about how much money I was spending on cable TV. He says, what did you do? I said, I switched to satellite. <clears throat> it's cheaper. He didn't know what to say to that, but I did that on purpose. You know what? You know what? Here's another thing. Here's another thing people judge, how people spend their money. Well, that was just a waste. Why do you care? If you think it's a waste for that person to do that, then don't you do that. I, you know, I travel. I eat out a lot on the road. I travel so much. We were in Chicago airport yesterday, and, and I'm thinking, man, up at the corner, here's a Starbucks, and there's a rest, this restaurant's over here. And I'm like, I ain't been through Chicago in a long time, about three months or so since I've been through there. And I'm thinking, how do I remember all this stuff? Well, because I go there, right? And... Listen, if brother so-and-so wants to go to Dunkin' Donuts 10 times a day, why do you care? Well, that seems like a waste of money to me. Well, maybe it is, but who cares? Why do you care? Here's a good example about ladies' makeup. Here's that illustration I said. This has to do with travel, all right? Culturally, down south, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, it is culturally acceptable for women to in churches to wear lots of makeup. I mean, like you could chisel your name in their face, right? The old joke was enough to paint uh, enough paint to paint a battleship and enough powder to blow it up, you know. And uh, and uh, there will be somebody who wears a lot of makeup. I've heard this. I have heard this. Why are they dress like a whore? I've heard that because a woman wears a lot of makeup. Why are they dressing like a whore? Okay. Let's go to Columbus, Ohio. Down in the bottoms where Jimmy Hood Church is. He's in heaven now. But let's go up Broad Street. And you'd be hard-pressed. Brother Scott, to find a harlot on Broad Street wearing makeup. 
So if you want to use that logic, if you want to use your logic, she ain't got no makeup on. How come she dressed like a whore? <laughs> right? Same logic. Same logic. Well, Brother Craig, that's kind of carrying it too far. Yeah, you sure are. I agree. You're carrying it way too far. I'm telling you, some of them ladies down in these southern churches, I, could, I go to 70, 80 years old. I'm talking about a man, Sherwin Williams is jealous of them. I'm, I mean, Dutch boy, all of them, man, they wish people spent that much money on paint. What they spend on makeup. That's a cultural thing. They ain't got nothing to do with whether they walk in the streets. Dear God, I mean, come on, use your brain, people. You say, that's ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. It's ridiculous. You don't believe in wearing makeup? Don't wear any. Don't wear it. But don't judge somebody that does. Well, a woman that does. If a man wears it, judge away. Amen? Judge away. A lady that weighs, wears makeup is not spiritual or unspiritual, and a lady that does not wear makeup is not spiritual or unspiritual. Verse 18. Change the title of this message, Brother Skip, to Aren't We Having Fun Today? Amen. Uh, verse 18. For he hath, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Guess what? A woman that wears a hat is acceptable to God. A woman that doesn't wear a hat is acceptable to God. A woman that wears makeup is acceptable to God. A woman that doesn't wear makeup is acceptable to God. A woman that wears pants is acceptable to God. A woman that doesn't wear pants is acceptable to God. A man that wears shorts is acceptable to God. A man that doesn't wear shorts is acceptable to God. We don't like that. Because God really, honestly, God really should judge everybody based on our standards. I mean, why have the Bible when we have standards? We live that way sometimes. We think that, so, that way sometimes. You say, Brother Craig, it's kind of, I, I know this is hard. It's hard on purpose. It's hard by design. You say, why are you being so hard? If it has just a little bit of effect, I'm happy. We got to blow that self-righteousness out of every single one of us, and we got to do it all the time. Amen. You just get up and you say, we shouldn't be self-righteous. Nobody's going to change. But when you add some intensity and a little bit of humor to people to get the ridiculousness of it, hopefully it'll change. It'll help us to change. Verse number 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. You follow the Pharisees around. They didn't, they didn't create an atmosphere of peace anywhere they went. It was misery and stumbling blocks and destruction and confusion and things wherewith we and things wherewith one may edify another. We're not supposed to judge each other, we're supposed to edify one another. Well, I just can't edify. I just can't put my stamp of approval on that. Really? I mean, really? Well, you know, if I'm seen in public with them, then it's you know, then it's like I'm approving of them. You think too much. And on the flip side of that coin, you don't think at all. You think Jesus was worried who saw him talking to that naked man? You think he cared about that? No, he was going after a soul. And it worked, by the way. You think that man would have got saved? If Jesus would have said, no, I, no, go away, put some clothes on, come back, and I'll talk to you. Just, no, I, I man, there's people around here that know who I am, and they're looking at me.
Verse 19, let us therefore follow that which makes for peace. A judgmental spirit does not bring peace in a church. It brings destruction. I'll bet you we could find more examples of pants split in a church than wrong doctrine. Amen. And things wherewith one may edify another. Well, you know, I mean, that's fine, but, you know, I just, I can't fellowship with them. You know, you're, you're, you're too afraid that your little precious angel is going to be polluted by them worldly Christians over there. Guess what? Your little precious angel ain't little, pre he ain't precious. She ain't precious. They're devils. Just like you are. They got the same dirty, rotten, stinking flesh that you got. You know the, you know what's wor you know what's you know what I hate about Pharisees the most? When Pharisees have children, they reproduce other Pharisees. They do. I've been in churches. I've seen five year old kids tell other kids, I we can't play with you. I've seen ten year old kids, well, we're not allowed to play with you. Why can't you play with me? Well, because your mom wears pants. What made them say that? They heard mom and dad talking, flapping their big mouth. Man, I'm, I'm, you talk about wanting to get in the flesh. And I'm not talking about being self-righteous in the wrong. I'm telling, you know what Jesus did to the Pharisees? He made a whip and beat them for good reason. It was a language they understand. And the only language Pharisees understand is blunt force trauma. It's the only thing that, I mean, they got thick heads and thick hearts. That's the only thing it takes to get it through their thick head. And they still don't get it. If I ever hear of somebody in this church telling somebody else in this church, we can't fellowship with you because you do this and this, there will be problems. You might even ask to be, to find a church you could fellowship with. I don't want Pharisees in my church. It's not my church anyways, it's God's church, but it's my responsibility. We all got Pharisee in us. We do. We all got pride in us, we do. But you better keep it to yourself. When it starts affecting your when it starts affecting your spirit and your flesh and it starts affecting the, the attitude of the church, that's when we have a problem. So if you're not going to repent from your Pharisee ways, then be a closet Pharisee. And don't come out of the closet. Shut the door, lock the bolt, throw away the key. Amen. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to be a hard guy. I'm saying Paul devoted a whole chapter to this. Jesus dealt with it all through the Gospels was that self-righteous attitude. You think it's got any better now? It's worse. We got people who have made a test of fellowship. Even worse than that, they've made, an, they've made a determinant of somebody's salvation based on what they see on the outside. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Anybody here get their gas at Robinson's? If you get your gas at Robinson's, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, do you get, uh, that's all we got around here, Robinson. I'm trying to think of another gas station. Anybody get their gas at McCusick's? Do they have stores? Convenience stores? All right, for the sake of that. Don't you know Robinson sells beer? You supporting beer. Anybody get their groceries at Shaw's? They sell liquor. Yeah, you supporting that, ain't you? Yeah, I mean, we know it was bread, but it really goes, your, really, your money really goes to buy beer.
Anyways. I got like seven more pages of notes. Um, let me see if I can, let me see what I can leave out that we've not hit. Oh, yeah, here's this. Well, the only reason, uh, the only reason that I say something to them is I'm, I'm concerned about them. No, you're not. More than likely, you probably aren't. But maybe you really generally are, but you have misguided concern. You have misguided concern. What we call concern, God calls being a busybody, a talebearer, a slanderer, and sowing discord. And God hates you if you sow discord. Well, we can't, we can't, you know, I mean, we can't go over to their house. Why can't you go over to their house? Well, they got TV. He wears shorts. She wears pants. You're a disco tour, and God hates you. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not real fond of you either if you're doing that. We would call them today drama queens and pot stirrers. Verse 20, you say, Brother Craig, you preach this stuff, you're going to split the church. I know I'm trying to prevent a church split. I don't want a church split. Verse 20, for meat, destroy not the work of God. And that's exactly what people will do. They will tear up a church over a piece of material or an electronic because they're right. Yeah, bless God, I, got, I convinced them to get rid of their TV. Yeah, and people looking at you with them behind them is seeing death and destruction and smoke and fire and... Amen. For meat, destroy not the work of God. Let's not destroy the work of God over stuff. If New Life Baptist Church is going to split, and I don't want a church split, but I'd rather live and ask God to get us through a split over doctrine and right than fleshly stuff that don't amount to a hill of beans. There's a lady I'm thinking of. I always enjoy using her as an illustration in this. I... I think of Brother David Evans' mom. Kay Evans is one of the most spiritual ladies I know. Walks with God. You ain't going to find Sister Kay Evans in a, in a dress or a skirt unless it's Sunday or Wednesday. And I've t some of you haven't heard this because you, you, you haven't been around that long. We used to spend winters down there at, at Brother David's Sister Bobby's house. And they live right next door. I mean, just across the way a little bit from... Brother Larry and Miss Kay. There'll be times I get up 4.30 in the morning in that camper to do what you have to do in the middle of the night. And I look out the window and I see, and I would see the, the addition down at, and there, and the lights would be on. You want to know why the lights were on? Sister Kay's down there reading her Bible and praying. But yet we'll make a determination on whether she's spiritual or not based on outward stuff. God's looking at the heart. Verse 22. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Do you have an extra biblical standard? Have it in private. Have it in private. I don't mean compromise your standard when you go out, but realize that it's between you and God, and don't flaunt it. Or just be honest. 
Just get a neon blinking sign hanging around your neck and say, I have standards that aren't in the Bible and you should too. Because that's what people, that's what they think. That's what they think. A Bible standard is, a bi is something that the Bible states clearly. An extra biblical standard is something that there might be a principle, but at face value, you ain't getting what you got out of it. Not that there would be anything wrong. Okay, would we be harmed if we all threw out the TV? No. Would, amen. Thank you. And I'm being serious. I'm not being mean. I'm being serious. There are some preachers I, can't show, I cannot share a motel room because I'm going to have zero time to myself to read my Bible and pray or study because they're going to be watching TV. That's okay. Watch all the TV you want. I'm just going to get my own room. No problem. I'm not better. They're not worse. I just got, I got to do what I got to do. No problem. <sighs> when we sit in judgment, we are determining someone's spirituality based only on what we see. When we sit in judgment, we are making ourselves the standard of spirituality. But remember this, when we sit in judgment, we are attacking the character of one of God's children. Verse 15 says, destroy not him with thy meat. Verse 20 says, destroy not the work of God. You don't even have to concentrate on destroying the work of God. You just destroy a person, you're going to end up destroying the work. All right, Lord, let's close with this one. John chapter 7. You say, well, Brother Craig, that's the law. Yeah, which is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, which was given to the Jews. In John chapter 7, we have the story of our Lord and Savior breaking the law. John chapter 7, verse 24. Uh, where am I at? That's not the verse. I got the wrong reference down here. Hold on. Huh? Ah, where Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He wasn't supposed to do that. 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? The table of showbread was not to be eaten. What did David tell his men to do? Because they were hungry. Go eat it. I love watching Pharisees start hyperventilating when they get, you know, when they see certain stuff. I remember this one incident. I don't even remember who it was or where we were, but I remember seeing it. This mother had to protect her precious little flock you know, from these worldly people. I can't even remember what the offense was. I don't know if the woman had a pair of pants on or I don't know what it was. Or I don't know what it was. But I remember they seen these people walk in and she gathered them up like a herd and rushed them out. Couldn't be in the presence of wickedness.
Yeah, well, Brother Craig, I just really believe. No, you're stupid. I mean, you're just stupid. There's no way to put it that's just stupid. I know people don't like the word stupid, but there are some things that are just stupid, and that's stupid. Put in bold letters, 150 font, highlight it, neon blinking. That is. Thank you. I didn't want to say it again. Here's a real test if you're a Pharisee. You see somebody that don't have the same standards as you, and you say something like this. Well, I just don't understand how God could bless somebody like that. I've heard him say it. You know, you know all these great singers that get up with a touch of God on them, and God moves in, and God blesses? If you knew some of them like I know some of them and know what they're like not in church, you wouldn't sit and listen to them. Not that there's bad people, but based on your standards, they're bad. I've been in meetings with people, with preachers, that I'll just be honest with you, not my cup of tea. But man, when they get in the pulpit, they'll give you something. You want to know why they're not my cup of tea? Because I, I'm, I'm, I got a Pharisee cup of tea. I'm drinking my Pharisee tea. Now, don't sit there and think, well, Brother Craig, who are you aiming at? Everybody. All of us, including me. We got to be reminded of this stuff all the time. Why? Because the devil wants to get in and destroy us and the work of God. And he can destroy it very quickly. We, listen. I believe, I believe we're doctrinally correct here. You know, and, and when there's been instances where people have preached something not doctrinally correct, all right, uh, I've, I've dealt with it when I felt the Lord needed me to deal with it and, and, and all that. But if the devil can't destroy a church with false doctrine, he will destroy a church with Pharisees and pride. And he'll probably be able to... See, here's the thing. False doctrine sometimes takes years to get introduced to a church just because it's a little at a time. But he could destroy a church with a Pharisee in two minutes. He could. He can't. He has. Amen. He has. We're not going to have an invitation. We're not going to have a piano player. I'm not going to ask people to come down and slobber and all that all the way over the altar. Here's the invitation. Don't be a Pharisee. And if you are, repent. Turn in your Pharisee phylacteries. Jesus hung out with people that Baptists won't hang out with today. That's a truth. He, the woman at the well, he. He hung out with murderers. He hung out with harlots. He hung out with thieves. That's who he hung out with because he was trying to reach them. Well, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reach them. No, you're not. You're trying, to create a, you're trying to create a duplicate of you. You're trying to create a mini you. You're trying to reproduce yourself in them. It's not their life for yours. It's our life for his. It's all about him. It's all about him. Listen, if you think you if you think you're a woman and you should wear an evening gown 24-7, have at it. 
we're going to laugh at you and make fun of you because we're Pharisees too. But have at it. You want to wear an evening gown to the floor with a 10-foot train behind you because you think that's right. Have at it. But that's for you. Amen. Ah, I feel cleansed. I feel refreshed. I feel rejuvenated. I ain't preached in this pulpit in three weeks. I've been here. Brother Barnes preached, and then the men preached the week before, so I'm getting it all at one shot. All right. He said, what are we going to do the rest of the day? I don't know. We'll meet back about 1.30, about 1.30. Um, have lunch uh, or go home, whatever folks doing. Go get pizza. Go support the liquor sales at Robinson's. And, uh, and then we'll be back. Let's do this, okay? I understand it was long. Uh, the afternoon service, just because we're going to do this, don't mean it's going to be longer. Uh, we'll start at 145 instead of 130, okay? 145 instead of 130. Uh, but that don't mean we're going to go 15 minutes longer at the end. Um, I promise. I promise. <clears throat> I promise, okay? Both hands weren't on the pulpit. No, we... we uh, I've asked, uh, uh, I got a little thought, but I've asked uh, the guys, uh, the folks that went to Shady Acres to give a quick testimony just about what the Lord used in their heart and um, how the Lord worked in their heart in the meeting, give a testimony. Uh, that was not a click that went down there, okay? Uh, Miss Jean went last year. I go every year. Jeremy says they were thinking about going, and so it worked out. But, man, if you all ever want to go to a meeting, Shady Acres got a great camp meeting. And uh, the Lord really, really, it was good. It was good. And uh, we're already talking about next year. I I'm not driving to Houston, okay? I am not driving to Houston, Texas from Dover, Foxcroft, Maine. Um, but if you ever had the opportunity to go, you could not put a price on what, we saw this week and how the Lord blessed us. All right, we'll be back at 145. Lord, bless the uh, message. Bless the, uh, our lunch and fellowship, whatever folks do. And Lord, be with our service uh, to follow after that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are dismissed.